Maurits, can you talk again? Yeah, I can talk. Okay. Look good. Just checking something. Well, be careful when you type. Yeah, I know.
All right, good luck, Marius, and the rest. Hello, good afternoon or morning, and for some people, evening. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We will wait five more minutes until we start, and then, uh, then we'll get going. Yes, hello again. People are entering the, the call, so that's great. We've got about 210 people that registered. Uh, people are entering now. We wait uh, five more minutes and then we'll uh, start. Yes, again, we, we start in a few more minutes. We just wait while everybody is uh, entering the call. Thank you. Yeah, we wait two more minutes and then we'll start. Welcome everybody, thanks for participating.
Okay, I think we can just uh, start the webinar. Welcome everybody. Thank you for participating in this uh, buy-in webinar, buy-in in the era of open banking, um, to redefine the open banking uh, ecosystem. Uh, just some, some ground rules for this webinar. Um, everybody participating, uh, please keep your mute on. Um, keep your, your, your camera off if you like, because we record this uh, webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them via the chat. And I will ask them in your behalf to the, to the presenter. Um, if you ask me a question, I can follow up to that uh, later on. And at the end of the session, we have a Q&A. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm your moderator, Maris van der Plas, uh, responsible, director of Van Haren Learning Solutions. My colleague Rolf van Veldhoven, he's also uh, helping me out as a moderator to uh, let everybody into the session at this moment. So thank you for that, Rolf. Uh, then uh, regarding the uh, webinar agenda, again, you can ask us questions via the chat. Some. Uh, yeah, some obstructing news uh, before we move on. So, um, sadly enough, our keynote from PNC uh, last minute had to cancel for our uh, webinar today. So that's uh, that's a pity. Also, because she was a very strong presenter, she still does want to participate in this webinar or at a webinar. So she will do so uh, next month. Uh, next month we have another webinar planned in this session. And she will participate there because it was so last minute. We didn't manage to find a find a replacement for her. For her, luckily, or what's an upside is that in the search for a replacement, uh, we did find many more uh, suitable case studies uh, for upcoming webinars. Uh, but sadly enough, at such a short notice, we couldn't find anybody else. Luckily, Udai um, from CCNC Solutions they have prepared a, a, a case study which they made uh, providing training uh, the last couple of months. So they will present this instead. So you still have some premium uh, content that will be uh, presented to you today, which is actually used in, in live trainings. Um, so I hope that this is still uh, um, adds some value and this is a slight uh, compensation. Once again, so the 20th of May, we'll have uh, probably Heather and maybe other presenters also uh, participate. For this, uh, for this webinar, uh, first here a quick introduction, then Vish will share about the BN ecosystem and success factors for BN implementation. Then Yulai will go a bit more into the uh, BIM adoption journey and afterwards share the sample case study. Um, yeah, and so the next, and then we'll have a QA and the next event will be the 20th of May. Um, after this webinar, you will share with you the recording. You also um, uh, will also ask you for feedback, and we also share with you the buy into the 90 ebook. If you have more questions, feel free to mail our marketing, and also would like to rec recommend you to visit the buy practitioner community, which is hosted by buy and there's a lot of uh, helpful uh, information, such as a certified professional repository. Frequently asked questions. You can also ask questions there, and they will be answered by buy experts or by the community. And there's much more information there. Also, um, for those uh, who received an email earlier, uh, probably it was Murphy's Law, there went something wrong. So a few people did got an email twice uh, regarding the invite for that also. But now we're ready and we can uh, get going uh, with the webinar. Um, first up, what is BIN? For those who don't know, BIN is the Banking Industry Architecture Network a collaborative not-for-profit ecosystem formed by leading banks and technology providers and consultancies and academics all over the globe. Uh, the, the goal of buying is to create and establish, promote, provide a common framework for banking and inter interoperability um, and to become recognized as a world-class reference point for interoperability in the banking industry. Uh, then, who are members of BIN? Here's a quick overview of current uh, BIN financial institutions that are members of BIN. Um, outside the financial institutions, these are also members and partners of BIN, uh, so consultancy firms and technology providers, and much more. And then we also have BIN academic and standard bodies and training partners, such as CCNC Solutions and Envision. 
uh, CCNC solution, which will participate now. These are accredited training organization and it can assist you with training. Then indeed, I already give a quick introduction. So who are we and who is CCNC solutions? So uh, we, uh, Vanara Learning Solutions, Vanara are the um, certification provider for BEYOND. We do the execution of the BIOS certification um, and our sister organization, Van Hare, is the publisher of BIOS. So that's our role and um, we act in that behalf. And CCNC Solutions is a, a world recognized uh, accredited training organization also in BIOS. And you will hear more of them later on. And then now I will give the mic to uh, Vish. <coughs> Thanks, Maurice. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, this is Vish. Uh, the full name is uh, Vishwanathan. And uh, I live in Australia. Uh, as you know, my name sounds like uh, uh, somebody from India. I migrated about 40 years back. And when I came to Australia, I realized that uh, in this part of the world, we can't pronounce any long names. So I cut my name short to Vish, V-I-S-H. That's stuck now. So please, please call me Vish. OK. Now, um, what? Who are we? Um, our company is called Three Cs. The three Cs uh, stand for connectivity, communication, and collaboration. In any relationship, you know, whether it's human relationship or uh, system relationship, we first connect, then communicate, and hopefully we can collaborate. That's the our our uh, uh, objective. So we have lots of uh, specialists and experts in architecture. Our core competence is architecture. So we live and breathe architecture, and we have a consulting and training team uh, in different parts of the world. And we have uh, some uh, prestigious customers like uh, HSBC. Right now, we're conducting training courses all over the world. We have many banks, uh, you know, insurance companies, many within the financial institutions. So we have a, a lot of Fortune 500 customers who we have trained, uh, upgraded the skills, provide certification, as well as hold their hands till they get their act together. Uh, in this whole conversation, we'll be talking about architecture, enterprise architecture or solution architecture. That's something which the organizations have to do. As you know, you cannot outsource it uh, completely lock, stock and barrel. Organizations like banks and insurance companies and uh, health organizations, they take control of their own architecture, but they can use external organizations like us on a spot basis. So we don't uh, presume that we will take over the you know the entire uh, setup because it's for the organization to do that. We fit in the middle space between strategy and execution. The strategy is being decided by so many times by some big four consultants like McKinsey's and others. There are lots of project organizations who is handling the middle space. That means how do you connect strategy to execution? That's mostly left to the end user organizations. Many times they don't have the resources, they don't have the time because they are in the banking business and insurance business or government business. They are in the, not in the business of uh, looking at architecture per se. So we fit into the space. We actually help companies start architecture practice. Next slide. So let's step back for a moment and, this, and think about what we are talking about. Today's banking ecosystem, the digital ecosystem, is not confined to a bank like we know it before, a brick and mortar place where uh, moms and dads can come and uh, you know do some personal business with the banking banking bank managers is very different. Uh, it's moving towards uh, a lot of lot of things are digitized and the banking system itself is not confined to the bank. It's an extended enterprise which consists of primarily the customer ecosystem, as you see on the left hand side and the partner ecosystem. So I'd like to introduce here, like we said, three C's about our companies, the five C's in the banking system. The most important C is, of course, the customer. The customers are becoming more knowledgeable. They're demanding more and more. They're increasing, their expectations are increasing day by day. Second C is collaborators or partners. The partners, there are traditional partners, like you know the, um, the card companies and lending companies and others. But there are new partners for banks like the mobile companies, which provide mobile wallets, mobile payments. Then there are cryptocurrencies uh, creeping in. There are a lot of crowdfunding companies. So the organizations we call as partners, the partners themselves are uh, expanding into, into several new areas. So in this complex ecosystem, 
consider uh, comprised of the bank, uh, the customer ecosystem, and the partner ecosystem. The it, it's not just a you know fair place you visit to uh, to do a bank, and or just doing online banking. It's much more than that. Digital banking is today about how banks can embed their own capabilities, the bank's own capabilities into the customer ecosystem as well as into the partner ecosystem. It's about working with partners and customers in a seamless way. That's why the, the uh, things like Bayan, the Banking Industry Architecture Network, is extremely significant in today's banking digital ecosystem. There are three, a few questions. What are the challenges to the banks? The first challenge is, are they able to provide services in a way that can be easily consumed by the consumer, consumers, customers, and also managed by the partners? Are the banks ready for initiatives like open banking, which we'll be talking about a lot in this presentation? Are they seeing uh, compliance? For example, a lot of compliance coming from regulatory authorities in every country. Are they seeing compliance as a nuisance or it's actually a new opportunity for innovation? Can the bank give up its direct customer relationship because they don't have uh, everything is through through you know through these online systems and outsource everything at service? How do you balance the traditional banking of uh, you know the uh, personal banking with digital banking? So these are the challenges. Next one. So we talk about Bayan. Uh, simplistically, the banking industry architecture network can be thought of as uh, a move from core banking to core less banking. Many of us in this presentation webinar, we actually, those from the banking industry, have been used to core banking. The banks have spent hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes billion dollars on core banking systems. Over in the 90s and to early 2000s, banks have spent lots of money in developing their own core banking system from scratch. What's the difference between core banking and core less banking? Core banking is mostly in-house and firewalled. Core less banking is widely distributed and in fact boundary less. There is no boundary for that. Core banking is monolithic, large, unwieldy, many times made up of static and fixed connections. But dynamic, but, but core less banking is made up of dynamic connections and relationships. Core banking is difficult to change and many times Bank, banks are embedded in the old legacy technology and they're very difficult to change or integrate. The idea of cordless banking is it should be very easy to integrate. It's component based, so easy to integrate, easy to change. And core banking is made up of a lot of point to point connections. Over the years, we found that several point to point technologies have been developed. You connect something to something, something to something. At the end of the day, it looks like a series of cross connections. But in a core less banking, it's a seamless connection of elements, almost like a neural network. <laughs> Lastly, uh, to summarize, the core banking from our perspective has been like an architecture by accident. It was never planned. They buy a few products, new systems develop, they, they buy some packages, they, they integrate something, uh, connect a lot of point to point, and from point to point, it becomes an architecture just by accident. From that, the core less banking, we want to move into architecture by design. So the whole journey, if you think about it, is moving from architecture by accident to architecture by design. In that, in that context, we think of these four layers. Okay, In the top layer is a business ecosystem, which consists of business capabilities, business processes, and is banking industry specific. That's where Bayan contributes the most. The next layer below that is what we call a digital ecosystem. There are components and services, and these are again banking related. So these service elements are also provided by Bayan. The third layer, the cross, which is like what we call a digital ecosystem, is more like a cross industry layer. It's not specific to banks. In that layer, from top, if you come to the top, come to the top, the third layer, actually you can think of a lot of cross industry services. For example, a Microsoft Teams is a service. Uh, Confluence by uh, is a service, Salesforce is a service, AWS, Azure, etc., are cloud services. So these are horizontal services which fit into the third layer. So the top two layers, which are banking specific and provided by uh, mostly by Bayan, make use of the services in the third layer. 
The last one is infrastructure. Of course, infrastructure is today has become like plumbing. You know, it's commodity. What we need is high bandwidth, high connectivity, high performance, high availability, high reliability, high resilience networks. So that is given. So if you think of uh, these four layers, the Bayan components have to work with these bottom two layers, but provide a lot of components which can be readily used for the top two layers. Next slide. <clears throat> So again, if, you, if, if the organizations have decided they want to implement Bayan, as, as you know, from my perspective, Bayan is never implemented. It's gradually included in the organization because every organization has got some kind of architecture. What we're trying to do is move towards an open component-based architecture. So it's a gradual process, unless it's a greenfield. There are a lot of greenfield banks starting up. They can, of course, implement the components-based architecture from day one. But in a typical traditional bank, which is existing for the last uh, you know, 50, 100 years, it is going to be a gradual evolution of the architecture, as I said, from a core banking kind of architecture to coreless banking made of components. So in that journey, what are the three critical factors that are needed? Number one is the framework. The framework is on the top, and uh, it has to be industry standard. It has to be open framework. Uh, you can click once more. Maris. So, so what the second part is actually the, the uh, you know the, the 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 process involved in evolution of the architecture. We combine. We actually think of four processes. How does the actual architecture evolve? While evolving, we need to have a proper change management, and and also it has to be governed by a, a high level governance. And last one is measurement or metrics. The evolution process, change management process, governance process, and measurement process. These are the four processes which are actually embedded into this whole architecture journey. But having a framework is not the only, only thing that's, that's, that's uh, needed. You need a, something to actually to add proper notation and a tool set. There are many tools available which, can, uh, which are compatible with Bayan and compatible with the notation that, that we'll introduce later. And of course, don't forget the most important part, which is the structure and people. And the people have to be knowledgeable. Not only knowledgeable, they have to be certified. So what's the, what's the necessity for certification? The certification gives you assurance, whether it's a, a supplier of the services or the receiver of services, they are assured that the people who are certified have got a certain amount of knowledge and they can be hired with confidence. So it reduces the risk in implementations. Next slide. Uh, sorry, just click once more. Okay. So in this context, we are talking about three things. What is the framework we are talking about in this context for today's Bayan? The, the modeling uh, notation is one of the notations which is very appropriate for architecture is Archimate. The Archimate is the modeling notation and certified tool, which is certified both for Bayan and for Archimate. So these are the tool sets. And one of the such tool is BizDesign. On the left-hand side, you can see the Bayan Certified Architects. So that's where we are leading to. The, the, the important people element is provided by Certified Architects. That's where certification fits in. Next one. So how does certification help? Uh, we actually look at it from three perspectives. The first is actually a banking, banking professional perspective. So the banking professionals First of all, it, requires, it gives a global recognition for knowledge and competence. It's portable, portable certification. So actually, you can move from uh, one location to another location, and still, actually, the certification is useful. The second one is the most important one, from my perspective, is provides a professional pride, self-confidence, and morale. What happens in, when people get certified in Bayan? They exhibit it in the link site, uh, link, LinkedIn site, and they brag about it that we can't forget that part of the morale boosting aspect of it. Of course, it provides career opportunities, global career opportunities, and it enhances visibility among the peers, industry peers who are, who are, who are certified. They look at each other and then uh, and, and, and exchange knowledge. So that is the, the... So certification is very useful from a banking professional perspective. Next slide. How does the bank certification help banks themselves, banks and financial institutions? 
the Bayan actually knowing Bayan very well and being certified and being uh, competent helps them to fast track the digital journey. When the bank is involved in a digital transformation journey, it's good to have certified architects who think the in the same way, who are on the same page, who understand the same terminology to fast track implementations. Of course, it should include uh, improve solution efficiency. The design of solutions and developments are based on uh, Bayan components. Everybody follows the same kind of uh, patterns, and you get the you know. Of course, you should get the design and uh, development time should be much less. It's future proofing, as many vendors follow Bayan and get certified for Bayan. By the way, Bayan has two kinds of certifications at this moment. One is people certification. That's what mainly we are talking about. The people are certified for Bayan's uh, competency. The second one is product certification. Products and solutions in the banking industry also get certified saying they're compatible with Bayan. So organizations, banks will be able to select the right products in the RFI and RFP stage when they're selecting products, they will be able to uh, be assured that the products work together, they're interoperable if they select the Bayan certified components. It provides opportunities for open collaboration with other partners, uh, not only other banks, but also with other service providers and solution providers. It offers capabilities for providing enhanced customer experience because most of the solutions coming from uh, <coughs> Bayan, they, they actually deal with customer experience side of things. And of course, it op provides opportunities for innovation. So from an end user or bank, banking perspective, financial institution perspective, following Bayan and open architecture has got a lot of benefits. And of course, certification assures that you are dealing with the <coughs> selecting the right people and the right products. Next one. <coughs> so how does band certification help vendors? I already covered that in a way. Uh, there are many kinds of uh, vendors. There are consultants, uh, there are solution providers, the system integrators, wherever they're coming from. If they are providing banking solutions and services to banking customers, they can offer products that comply with the open international standard. Obviously that should improve marketability of products and uh, uh, the visibility among in, uh, global you know, customers in a global market. It must enhance sales competitiveness as compared to other proprietary products. It must integrate readily with other solution components because in the banking industry or like any other industry, no one solution or uh, product provides a complete solution. There are payment products, there are security products, there are uh, identity products, there are uh, retail banking products, wealth management products. They have to have to interrupt together, interoperate together because most banks provide different kinds of solutions and they, depending on the type of solution, they may go to a different vendor. So if they want to, if they, if these vendor solutions and hardware and software have to interoperate and work together, it's better they follow a single standard, an open standard. Of course, uh, I, I want to repeat myself saying that it opens up opportunities for vendors for a global banking market. Uh, currently, in our company, we, train, we have trained customers from US, Europe, Africa, Asia, South America. There are requests coming from everywhere. So if you are a banking solution provider or product provider, it helps you to go beyond the borders to a global market. Next one. So in this journey, I think my colleague Godai will cover this in more detail. Uh, by an organization, there are a lot of working groups. There are working groups dealing with many subject matter. For example, as a payment working group, uh, we are very active in two working groups. One is called the adoption working group, dealing with uh, making Bayan more easily adoptable in the market, adopt, adopt in the market, and the other one is certification working group, which deals with people certification and product certification. In the in the adoption working group, we created. Uh, uh, a complete what's called as infographics. On the left hand side, you can see stage one, stage two, stage three, up to stage six. It's it's a simple infographics. If an organization is willing to are ready to go on a journey by on, what do they do? Of course, the very first thing logically they have to evaluate by on. They have, they have to be aware of by on. They have to attend uh, training courses, get certified, and evaluate is by on suitable for them. Once they decide yes, it is suitable then they actually, most cases, they build a pilot. Why? Because the banking uh, uh, systems are very complex. You can't uh, sort of, they say, you can't eat an elephant in one stroke. You have to eat in small bites. 
So what they do is they look at the, the which is going to give them the fastest benefit in the shortest time. Chase, it could be a pain point, it could be a business pain point, or it could be a particular business unit that is uh, that is that is absolutely in, uh, need need this kind of facility, or it could be new area. For example, a banking is entering into a, a wealth management area, that so that's a good time to introduce buyout. So you have to select the right one and have a pilot. And once they 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 build a business case for the pilot based on pilots is generally about three to six months. In three to six months, you show value, a quick win for the organization. So once you decide what the pilot is and have a clear plan for the pilot, you can execute the pilot. What does the pilot do? It, it's, it's a proof of concept as well as a learning exercise. You know, the people involved in the pilot not only create something, but also they'll learn a lot during this process by dirtying their hands. It's a hands-on exercise. And then the company may decide to adopt Bayan. That's a stage four. And once the director decide to adopt Bayan, then they have to go through a series of uh, uh, setup of processes and the organization structure uh, has to be set up correctly and the, and the architecture practice within the organization has to be set up. In this, we always talk about a combination of insider and outsider combination. Uh, we have been involved in this kind of architecture exercise for over 20 years. And most of the time we find that, of course, the architecture practice cannot be outsourced. You can't completely outsource lock, lock and barrel to a company and saying, take care of my architecture. That's not possible because the architecture is very close to the organization. Every organization has different types of architecture. It's very different. Even if you are in the banking area, architecture of one bank is different from another bank. So it cannot be outsourced. At the same time, you cannot do it yourself. Most banks find that they need different kinds of skills. You know. Um, from strategic skills to implementation skills to integration skills to project management skills, service management skills, lots of skills require all the way. So many times they depend on outside organizations as a partner. So what we found mostly is that a combination of insider and outsider combination is the best uh, one for uh, uh, ensuring success. So that is the kind of a journey that has been mapped by uh, the adoption working group. And what, what we are just showing to say some example of what kind of services are available from an organization like us or others in this whole journey. On the, on the, on the x-axis, you can see there should be some workshops initially at certain stages to establish either the evaluate buy-on or to find out your readiness for buy-on or find out your maturity, uh, the organization maturity. There are various kinds of workshops. The pilot stage and, and adoption stage also, there could be some involvement. Then certification, that's where it fits in. Certification, we're talking about people certification bits in, in, this, in, in, this, in this area, where uh, it is nice to have everyone involved in, the, in, 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 the, in this exercise, whether it's the core architecture team or the others who are touching architecture to be certified. So they all speak the same language, they're on the same page, they work together as a team, there's collaboration. And... There could be other workshops. And uh, so this shows, and there could be some consultancies which are required, spot consultancies which may be needed from the external organization. Or you could some, need some resources, the short-term resources. Okay, in, for example, you need a security expert for a few weeks. So these are the possibilities. So my colleague now, Uday uh, Bhatt, who is an uh, experienced uh, enterprise architect and buy an architect, We'll explain this journey in a bit more detail and hopefully we'll also give you some uh, couple of use cases. Thank you. Yeah, Uday, are you there? Hello, good day all. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are here, but also to everyone, um, just an update. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to ask in the chat and I can ask in your behalf to, to you die or also in the Q&A to, to Vish. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. Mike's to you, Udai, thanks. So this is a journey. So moving to the next slide. If you see on the left hand side, it is giving talking in terms of stages and the stages appears to be something like a quantum jump. Let me try to share some of the artifacts and instead of giving a quantum feeling can we have some analog feeling over there in this adoption journey and make life a little smooth so that's the whole purpose for this particular webinar moving to the next slide 
if you see in the first stage itself, why we need buyer? What is the gap analysis and what is the value proposition? These are the three very pertinent questions. And for doing that, moving to the next slide, it totally depends upon the business owner or the business decision maker, could be CT or CXO. What are your most important factor which is challenging you due to the changing market, due to this pandemic or due to any issue or the behavior changes of the human transaction? Is it application to application, business to business, business to C or deployment, agility, or any operational complexity, maintainability, or there, there could be many things. There could be a de centralized versus a decentralized decision making. So there are multiple dimensions over there for this particular uh, transaction and banking business. And something must be hitting the whole either bottom line or the top line. So based on those important factors, we want to move ahead and try to have some pilot of the case. So moving to the next slide, we go for the pilot case. Now, if, if we go in the pilot case, you see in between there is something called stakeholder, then there's the opportunity and there is some goal. Although it sounds very easy, but it has a complexity involved, involved in it, and some process needs to be maintained to find out all the three steps. So let's see how it is going to work. So moving to the next, and this slide is having multiple uh, transition. So this is a process nine steps. First is the select reference model viewpoint and tool. The reference model here is the Bayan service landscape. Viewpoint, we will discuss it. Develop baseline, what is there existing. Develop target, that in pilot, what we are going to achieve by using Bayan. And we try to create some architectural definition document, complete plan, so that we can implement it the pilot. So moving to the next slide, it will take two clicks. This is the reference model. So this is a, you can say, index list of all the service domains developed, created, maintained, identified by, uh, by an organization. It has business area referred as reference data, sales service, operations, risk compliance, and business support. It has business domains, something like marketing, loan and deposit, cards, et cetera, et cetera. And all the small non-visible ones are the service domain which represents the business capability in its elemental level. Now, once we got this reference and based on the scope of pilot, we might have identified certain service domains. So this whole bunch might reduce to a set. So moving to the next slide. So once we show, show that, so in this democratic world, when we are working in a geographically spread organization, we have to take inputs even before taking any decision with the different stakeholders. So this is an output of a stakeholder analysis heat map. Only the stakeholder names are sanitized. Based on the use cases, what we want to work in the pilot case, which is going to be covered into functionality, which are total number of 25. And we try to understand what are the different stakeholders, that means different department heads, has a view. Some are expecting something, some are latent, and some are not that sure. So that is not coming up. So then moving to the next slide, now we know how the, uh, all the stakeholders are feeling about this pilot. So out of that complete service landscape on the left hand side, which is represented in blue, green and yellow. It's a small chunk of uh, service domains, business area, uh, business area, business domain and service domain, which we have chosen for the pilot. And then we did three steps, filter, specialize and organize. And if you see on the right hand side, these are different views. The left top view uh, represents the cost and efficiency, which it's to the CTO. Uh, right hand side is transformational IT. It is mostly for the CTO. 
Then below that, it is a strategic role, which is for the CEO or CIO or the board members. And the left hand side is centralized and decentralized, which is going to give a view to the operations head, how the whole business operation for that particular uh, uh, pilot is going to be. So moving to the next slide. So this is the first step completed. Now, this is a gap analysis with the existing because we are doing pilot. So when we are doing the pilot, we try to create a gap analysis. So this is a heat map on the service domains and the green ones, it's good to go. Red ones are not that compliant. Little yellow and green are somewhat compliant and white one we have not considered because it is out of scope. So. So this is one of the way for doing, you can say, portfolio analysis for service domains based on existing uh, baseline system. Now moving to the next slide. Let us suppose we are going to work with a payment service domain. So if you see in three boxes, they are product fulfillment, payment engine that represents the core, and on top it is laid down the service domains identified and creating a complete solution for it. So this is from, from a completed solution for a pilot case. Now moving to the next. Yeah, uh, you die. Can I ask a yeah. question? Is that yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. So I got a question here from Roger. As, yeah. uh, as an industry standard, uh, being yeah. buying compliant, it seems, uh, it seems uh, to reach an end on the service domain uh, identification and some architecture elements like functional patterns, generic artifacts, uh, behavior qu qualifier types, and assets. Yeah. As it presents itself to be uh, implementation agnostic, further levels of specifications are only presented for reference, control records, uh, attributes, behavior qualifiers, business objectives, models, and scenarios, uh, and APIs. Yeah. Is it correct? Um, uh, sorry, I tried to read the question here. Is it correct um, my apprehension of it as a standard and all of its diagrams and tools support only usage? Not sure if it makes any sense when I ask this no, question. No. Uh, let me try to answer. Uh, for a particular service domain, uh, there are asset type, there are functional patterns, control records, behavior qualifiers, then action terms, service operations. Uh, so functional patterns, there are 19 func functional patterns which are fixed and is standardized by BAM. There are 17 action terms which are already fixed and all are represented on the BAM website, on the portal, in a meta model format in terms of uh, uh, Archimate notation. So far as the business object model and control records are concerned, they are also represented in terms of uh, entity relationship diagram uh, with all the cardinality in place. But those all the details for a particular service domain is good to understand. But if some so there are two scenarios to it. If somebody is just doing a pilot on a vanilla without doing any gap analysis, which I am referring to. So you can have an, have that particular API from the uh, Bayan website, or you can use the Swagger test suit. We are providing it and try to implement with a little bit of mapping with your business object model and entities what you have and try to test and simulate some business process between the interaction of APIs. So that uh, those all details are at an implementation level. But this is true only for 185 service domains. Having said that, there are 420 plus service domains and it is even increasing. So for those service domains where all these details are not there, the group is working and even certain people who are interested in, in interested in they can select a service domain and try and based on the historical fact and detail, the way uh, Bayan is uh, doing it, 
one can develop put it as a candidate then after whole uh, definition it will term as defined and then it will be organized and put into the service domain or the portal uh, for the uh, sharing of other people i hope i was able to understand and give some explanation to the question thank you right okay so moving to the next slide i think time is pretty less so i will move a little faster these are the you can say it is a uh, breakup of service operation and service operations are mainly broken into four categories called origination invocation delegation and reporting and these are standard names used in all service domains and those are associated with features so features are written over there now based on the features if my existing system so if i have a system 1 system 2 system 3 they are supporting features they are not supporting features or they are requiring some level of customization this type of excel sheet or tool based analysis can be done and further extending this particular analysis so moving to the next slide uh, we are going to come up with red green and amber uh, uh, red green and amber or yellow kind of uh, say data which gives a indicative idea how the pilot road map be so the, all the green ones can be carried forward to your target architecture the amber one can be carried forward to the target architecture with little bit of customization and red ones are those which can be either decommissioned or cannot be considered at all for this particular pilot implementation so moving to the next so this is uh, one that is feature based and this is the same kind of analysis based on component but it is based on risk and benefit because risk of implementation we know and what are the different benefits we are going to get which is a different view of from the cio cto or cfo perspective and that's how because business priorities will always be different than the technical priorities so the first one is giving you technical priority and this is giving you business priority and this is going to proceed while implementation of the pilot now moving to the next slide now after developing the pilot so we got the complete plan of the pilot and we uh, and we have taken a decision what we are going to uh, do it or not do it so now we will execute or deploy it so let's see moving to the next one so we will try to do because we are working with the core so this is a tier 2 layout so whether we are using with third party bank application uh, third party application or mobile or bank application over the internet we use the api gateway which is interacting with some kind of esb enterprise service bus maybe mule soft dell bumi or uh, fusion middleware and which is in turn talking to the core systems which are slightly rationalized so if you you don't see on the right hand side a big chunk of core platform it is slightly rationalized so these are modularized core system so that we can have a uh, have a pilot in place and we will see in our case study what do we mean by this also now moving to the next slide uh, so how we are going to adopt in a organization so next slide please we can have this kind of uh, we can have road map developed based on portfolio or whatever slide we have covered so far we have to take care of security and compliance we have to have strategies for deployment and we have to aspire for coreless so in coreless banking we adopt from direct to core wrapped host and ultimately we go to macro service and enter into the coreless banking now moving to the next to next slide next slide now this is a complete integrated framework which any organization can use which will support devs devops devsecops agility and continuous integration and continuous deployment on left hand side that is as you can say strategic section in which all the your business area business domain and service domains and the backlog which was not given has been consolidated planned for whatever we have discussed 
once all this API service domain has been identified and the business object model with data model got uh, streamlined, alias is being done, then that will pass over to the uh, right hand side where those APIs will be deployed on container or maybe on premise. That is a totally HOS and it will have all the source control, defect control, a, a feedback and all those stuff. And then that API can be used as an API catalog. So I used one word, we simulate the business process. That means all APIs can be deployed and then we uh, try to use the choreography by the container based on the demand and the demand will be documented in terms of business scenario and we fulfill it. And if you are using the cloud, then metering and the other thing will come into picture. If you are using on-premise, then it will be uh, just uh, choreography. And then when and then moving to the last right hand side, it is going on a production where end users are doing it and end users, whatever the feedback they will give, it will go into the respective towers so that things can be uh, improved upon. So this is a complete integrated uh, framework uh, uh, to support CI CD and your agility. Now moving to the next to next slide. Uh, when we are using this particular framework, we also need some level of computation of matrices. Uh, obviously, uh, there are 65 plus matrices, but I have just used a very basic one, which is very common. Everybody knows that. So cost variance is compliance, schedule variance, effort variance, because uh, effort and cost is the most important for the top management. Schedule is important for the project and PMO. Uh, risk compliance is also top management. So that's how we are going to measure. Now moving to the next one. Now we are talking that sample case study when we are saying in that particular journey, what we are going to do. So this is all about consumer loan. So moving to the next slide. Uh, consumer loan right now, let us suppose in this case, is assumed to be a core legacy platform. If you want to get Bayan aligned, and because we cannot challenge the, all the stakeholders, okay, in one way you go to the core less. So what we are going to do, we will do some sort of legacy realignment, and uh, we choose the APIs from Bayan and map with the business object model and the entities available. And we also try to find out what are the service domains or functionality which is beyond our scope, like credit rating. Credit rating is done by TransUnion or some other company, not by the bank. Bank might be doing it, but for their internal purposes, but officially it is something different. And nowadays even EKYC is totally different. So all those things we will find it out. And moving to the next slide, this is a schematic representation of, uh, you can say externalization. So in left-hand side, if you see it is a consumer loan legacy application in which customer transactions, workflow, service utility, and all these things are there. But there is a slight benefit over here because these are rationalized or modularized legacy system. Uh, maybe in reality, you may not get the similar kind of stuff, but then you can realign. So if you see all the blue ones, except the consumer loan fulfillment, they are all moved out from the legacy and called service domain, which are externalized. Now moving to the next one. These are the externalized service domains. So let me move the next one. So this is just a sample. So the question which was asked to me, this is the evidence for it. So I have, uh, instead of uh, having 12, I have just uh, taken one sample, uh, you can say meta model. So this is a, a consumer loan meta model. Uh, Archimate notation is done. So service operations are there and all the functional patterns, asset type, behavior, qualifier, everything is defined on top of it. And left hand side, there are three gray boxes. One gives you control record. Uh, second one gives you business object model. Third one direct you to the uh, API. If API is not available, then it won't be a link. Then moving to the next one. Now, this is the thing what somebody has to do. 
once somebody identifies a service domain and he he goes and reads he come to know that one service domain has multiple inputs and multiple outputs and that is not available on the website so uh, an architect has to create so if it is a consumer loan the input is coming from say customer loan account recovery session dialog payment execution and regulatory compliances and then it has to go out so it will give an output to position keeping that is balancing the account financial accounting payment order and blah blah so somebody knows how the whole system is uh, what is the input and what is the output and what is going to be the flow now moving to the next one now these are some sample there are total 11 scenarios but there are just three scenarios depicted over here whenever i talk scenario i always say when we talk in terms of process process can be developed coded or implemented when i talk in terms of business scenario whatever english may be but i always use the word we simulate the process you all always need to understand when the covid pandemic happened it, till now the scientists are just working with the organic compound of the periodic table only and they are trying to create a medicine for it they have not devised anything uh, apart from 137 uh, more than 137 element which is av not available in the periodic table so similarly this your bayan service landscape is works like a periodic table uh, once you identify all these service domains by doing the message exchange uh, depending upon the business scenario you simulate the business process what is uh, going to be uh, required by the business now moving to the next one now this is the business uh, object model for consumer loan and this business model has already identified entities and uh, elements and the cardinalities challenges is with the last slide which will uh, clear, make you clear what will be the challenges we are going to face so the next slide represents the uh, control record so control record is also a number of entities with all the car cardinalities involved so this you can also get it from the bayan portal but here your only high level design uh, ends your real problem starts from here moving to the next one this is just a you can say swagger screenshot for the consumer api where you can get a very standard json uh, or api for this particular consumer lens service domain which you can download but the now the whole problem here starts that whatever the data is given over here is the dummy data so the challenge is so the last slide which is the challenge moving to the next one uh, i think we can move to the last one challenges one this is fine one more so challenge is semantic api will serve as a reference api so during implementation journey for all the needs specific to bank we need to introduce the right sub qualifiers somebody says aliasing somebody say you can say metadata or meta model depending upon who uses what uh, in my country we normally use aliasing but we need to use all the right sub qualifiers in the service operation so that they can be discrete non overlapping rightly mirror the bank context because your existing bank context may not be uh, aligned with the business object model so this is a huge work for the uh, you can say data architect who are going to use the bayan for this apart from that uh, because it is the whole uh, standard is evolving so we need to keep track a process so that our all the deployment pilot or actual implementation are aligned with the ban uh, bayan and its changing versions so synchronization and releases should be well defined and so that there is no impact in your timelines and we also incorporate the bayan updates now what this uh, slide i have skipped it was nothing but uh, it is just a uh, you can say cloud deployment 
from the core by using the ESP. So that's, uh, I think that will be very easy to be uh, uh, interpreted. So I think it's already uh, almost the time. So if we can take some questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yuran. Um, great presentation. Thank you also for sharing the case study. Also very knowledgeable. I'm not sure if there's any question and answer so far from anyone. Please feel free to uh, to reach out. Oh, I, I had one question, but I already asked it to uh, Yudai. So it is now um, the, the one hour has passed. Just to um, uh, yeah, rehearse, let's say to repeat. Uh, the 20th of my, May, we have another webinar where Heather from PNC will be participating and hopefully also other uh, participants. If somebody has a, a question, feel free to uh, ask via the chat. Yeah, I am trying to read. I here have a question here from uh, uh, Yogo. Uh, can you give a brief overview on the process and requirements for vendor product certification? I think that's not true, maybe this. Uh, don't know. I think uh, the vendor asking about the vendor product certification. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, the vendor product certification is in the 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 product working the certification working group is working on it. They haven't finalized it. And that's Uday has got some latest news on that. Uh, actually, for the product certification, they are following the uh, you can say continuous uh, maturity model representation. So they have already identified the parameters for it and it is under review. So it's not like that whether you are beyond aligned or not aligned. It's not going to be Boolean. So even if some organization may be using uh, a tier one or tier two type of implementation where core system is also there, ESP is also there and they are using some level of uh, semantic APIs. So at a maturity level, it will be major and OK, you are buy-on compliant at a maturity level X. So that's how they are planning for the product certification. But right now, it is all about the semantic API and that maturity. Yeah, perfect. And then uh, a question from Rohan is to, um, even though you tried, uh, you're welcome, you know, even though you tried um, to skip the last two slides, we got the question if we can see the last two slides still. So uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the, this is the slide. Uh, uh, the first one is a generic one, and the uh, next one is a, uh, related to the Google Cloud. We can use any of the clouds, so don't assume that I have any uh, love or passion towards the Google Cloud. It ha just happens to be I prepared this one. So uh, coming to the first one, previous one, previous slide. Yeah. yeah. So if you see below the gray boxes are the core systems. So they are having your core bank your, your, or your core uh, loan, consumer loan application over there. Now, uh, some ESP, so mostly the people who are using ESP for buy-on implementation, mostly are MuleSoft or any point. And uh, there they are having some of the host wrappers on the uh, MuleSoft and uh, uh, on the cloud, on the API container, they are deploying the semantics uh, uh, service domain APIs for this consumer loan, whatever I have identified. Now, the left-hand side, what I was trying to show, that business application can be defined. What I am just trying to say, because in API container, it is just a listing of the service domain names. So just telling, okay, you downloaded the API, tested it, mapped the business object model and deployed over here. And you are totally dependent on the container for the choreography or any kind of, uh, you can say, orchestration. But for after doing this orchestration, if you see this left-hand side, uh, each block is, block is representing a service domain and they are doing a message exchange. And hence, it is they are trying to create or simulate the business process. So by deploying API container is the first step. Now, when I am uh, doing the orchestration of choreography, then I need the business scenario input, and then I will configure accordingly so that whenever the message exchange is happening, 
it gives me the proper, you can say, uh, re, uh, simulated business process in terms of business scenario. So uh, now for doing this, some challenges will be there. We have to have an API gateway. We need to white label it. And so right now we can do all this cloud deployment for the service APIs, which are not very strict with the regulatory compliance at a very in a pilot stage. But as and when the compliance and other things are taken care of, then we can move it. I think there is some sound, but I was not able to understand what it is. So this is a deployment. This is a generic deployment. And next one is the, for the Google Cloud. Whether you use a Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, or any data lake or anything, it's fine. Uh, right now, all, both the examples are container based only. Yeah, so you so can. There's two more questions. One is about the certification for people, and the other one is about the. Uh, can you also help us understand the case for payments uh, segment specialization? Uh, sorry, specialty for regulators which are supposed. Uh, su sorry, supported by buy-in. Is that? Would you also like to ex elaborate uh, to that question here? Uh, payment regulations. Yeah. So. Uh, can you also help us understand the use case for payment segment, especially for regulators which are supported by buy-in? Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, regulator. Regulator parts will be. I think it's nice to uh, reply a little later for this. Okay, we can we can come back to you uh, same via via email, then um, or we will at least. Um, then regarding uh, the question about people certification. Uh, so what also Fish and you they refer to is that the people certification um, and that's the buy-in uh, foundation certification, which is executed by us for our learning solutions. And you can study uh, for this by studying the book or, or participating in the training given by several training uh, partners. And when passing the exam, you're buy-in certified. And one of these training partners is also CCNC um, that is now giving the, the training here. And uh, sadly enough, our other participant was not here, but one of the statements he made is that certification is one of the first steps, but it's only 10% of your entire buy-in journey, but it is your first 10%. I'm not sure if I copied that quote correctly, Vish. I'm not sure if you remember yeah. how it was given. That's right. I think certification is the essential first step because once you, once people are certified, then we can start talking in the same language and same terminology. We know the process. Then once certification is completed, then you go through these uh, various stages of uh, you know the Bayan journey. You know, uh, understanding, evaluating Bayan. Well, even to evaluate Bayan, you need certification. So certification we see is the very basic thing. And right after that, you go through the seven steps. And uh, during these steps. Uh, the people who participate should, should be ideally only certified architects. Otherwise, there'll be misinterpretation and lack of understanding. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for elaborating. Uh, I see. Yeah, I hope that I answer our questions. If there's any more questions, please feel free to, to ask. If there's no more questions, I think we will uh, leave it at that. I also see people still trying to to admin at this moment. Um, yeah, so uh, I think we can then, unless there's questions coming in, still um, uh, wrap it up here. Thank you, Vis and Yurai for. Um, oh, I, I one other question. Uh, yeah, uh, whether uh, is is it an online exam? Um, yes. It is an online exam. Um, after purchasing the exam voucher, you can do the exam online uh, anywhere at any time. Uh, so it's very uh, digital, very efficient. And also part of the exam is also an exam trainer. So when you purchase the exam voucher, also the book is included and you also get uh, an exam trainer in the exam. So before doing the actual exam, you can train 60 questions. You see uh, your feedback and the answers um, before you actually go for the exam. And also when you go for a training course, um, they can include the, the exam voucher in the training course for the exam. Um, uh, and then another question that I get here. Um, 
Oh yeah, this is an answer. Um, yeah, no, so another question, is ArcMate a prerequisite for the Bayern exam? Uh, no, it is not. Um, so uh, a chosen uh, modeling language by Bayern is in ArcMate. They made this decision, I think, last year. Um, however, it's not a hard requirement or it's not a requirement to, to do Bayern or do the Bayern certification. Um, does it give any added value, Vish? Can you elaborate regarding uh, being ArcMate certified or knowing ArcMate? Yeah, page. because the you see many of this uh, many of these Bayan components are described in Archimate. So what I understand is that the basic subset of Archimate is used. So even if you don't know the complete uh, superset of Archimate, still you should know the basic subset to understand it. But when you start implementation, what happens is if you know the complete set of Archimate, it helps because the you can you can actually use it more elaborately. Co correct, Uday? What's the difference between Knowing Archimate and not knowing Archimate. Uh, actually, in the course, uh, there is a, a one complete slide which helps people to understand all the Archimate notation uh, from all for all the layers. So uh, that uh, I think facility is there in the Bayan. So uh, it's one single slide, but yes, it helps. But it is with the context with the service domain. So it makes people understand what how the notation uh, are being used and what uh, what the, does a notation represent. But if you want to get a complete understanding of Archimate, you must go for a, a three. We have a two to three days, a three days Archimate course. It's a separate certification for Archimate. You can have Archimate certification if you want to actually get a complete understanding of Archimate and appreciation and then use it uh, in, in your implementation. Yeah. Although, would you recommend face to first go for Archimate and then for buy? And I think you can do it. You, it's not a hard requirement. You can just go yeah, for no. There's no, um, yeah, preferred, preferred route, I reckon. Uh, Correct? Yeah. Uh, actually, there is a very beautiful question. Uh, the question is that after certification, how much time you will take to do one, I think, delivery? That's the question. <laughs> so it totally depends upon the scope or the use case you have chosen and how open is the organization and how much information you have with your baseline uh, system. Yeah, yeah. I think typically the, any architecture thing is certification is the first part, but just by understand, uh, by passing certification, one doesn't become an architect. So it's a journey for the architect himself, himself or herself. So what happens is the after certification, the best thing is to get involved in a project and get dirty your hands and then gradually learn through the process, and then it's actually a journey. So nobody becomes a, an architect just after getting certified, but certification is absolutely essential from our perspective, start the journey. Once you start the journey, uh, yeah, as Uday was saying, some organizations provide a quick opportunity for uh, implementation, others may not provide. If you're working for a service provider, it depends on who your clients are. So it's, uh, there are many, 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 you know, uh, ifs and buts. So, uh, for, but generally, if you're involved in one project, one interesting project over a period of three to six months, at the end of it, you will get an extremely good knowledge of uh, uh, implementation of Bayan. And uh, we, we uh, com companies like us can help you in that as well, as well as the Bayan, implement Bayan organization itself providing lots of uh, white papers, use cases, you know, everything. So one has to have this, uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, not only the certification, but the ability to understand, grasp these things from various places. That's why we said 10, 20, 70. In any learning process, 10% is attending the course and certification. 20% is your own external learning from other sources. 70% is actually actually working on a project. That's why our company is kind of, a, we call a full service organization. We help organizations not only get certified, but hold their hands in initial stages, in the startup stages, up to the time they become self-sufficient. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating. Are there any more uh, questions? Again, I still see people coming into the lobby. Uh, um, uh, yeah, again, any last questions from anyone? And we're wrapping up the, uh, the session. Um, yeah, last time uh, in, a, in 20th of May, we have another session uh, with uh, speakers from the industry. 
Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, if you have shared that we can share your details with CCNC, uh, we will. And you can also get in contact with them. After this webinar, we share with you the, the promised details of the, the book. Also, um, the possibility to get ready for next session. Um, also, re we re I recommend to visit the Buying Practitioners community where you can find frequently asked questions and much more resources. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is it then. Again, Fish, Yudai, thank you very much. And thank uh, you. give it another go in a month. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good uh, day and also night for you, Fish, and uh, Yudai. Yeah. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you for. Thanks. Uh, okay.